Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst and today I'm speaking with Vitalik Buterin about Ethereum, the general state of affairs and um, where everything is headed. Before I talk um, with Vitalik though, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Teddy Ho is an open source wallet, redefining the wallet as a public good. With Teddy Ho, you can safely connect to DeFi and Web3 with everything you need from MetaMask, plus a lot more. You can view NFTs in a wallet across Ethereum, Polygon, Optimism, and Arbitrum, and you don't actually have to manually add these networks, they already come plugged in. Teddy Ho has good ledger support um, and uh, is built by a community of developers that listens to its users. Swap between assets in wallet at a fraction of the price and conveniently view all of your account balances across multiple networks with our new and improved portfolio tab. Over 100,000 people signed um, the TallyHope Community Pledge, a letter to the Web3 community orchestrating um, their com commitment to building a wallet that's accessible to everyone, radically transparent and fully community-owned. TallyHo isn't just building a wallet that works, it's building a wallet that people can believe in. It's time to defend Web3. Visit telly.cash today to sign the pledge and download the wallet. And for Epicenter, we're hiring. We're looking for a community manager to help grow our audience and take Epicenter to the next level. If you're passionate about crypto and creating great content, we want to hear from you. Look, look for the uh, job description and details in the show notes. Um, and please also show with anyone you think might be a good fit for this. And now, without further ado, let's go to the interview with Vitalik that was recorded at DEFCON 6 in Bogota. Hi, my guest today needs no introduction. Uh, I'm here with Vitalik. Um, Vitalik, thank you so much for coming on Epicenter again. Thank you so much. It's good to be here again. Fantastic. Um, we have an hour, and I want to dive right into the meaty stuff. I hope that's okay. <laughs> sure, I love the meaty stuff. I mean, I prefer fishy stuff, but you know, meeting stuff is great. Okay, um, we'll, we'll get to the fishy stuff later, so okay. let, let's start with meaty. <laughs> so, uh, the state of the network and credible neutrality. So basically, if you go to mevwatch.info, it currently shows that over 50% of blocks um, are actually OFAC compliant, i.e. censored. Mm. Um, what do you make of that? It's a concern. Um, I mean, I think uh, it is important not to overstate the concern, though, right? Because uh, censorship resistance is um, what I call a yeah, one of interest model, right? So if 50% uh, of blocks are censoring, that just means that a yeah, transaction that's being censored by them would just needs to, on average, wait two blocks instead of waiting one block. And like, you know, even if 90% uh, start censoring, it will just have to, on average, wait 10 blocks instead of one. But at the same time, like it's also not a non-problem, and it's uh, definitely yeah, important for the ecosystem to start pushing against this more and uh, come up with uh, ways of uh, reducing the yeah, percent of blocks that are censoring and uh, improving uh, the yeah, guarantees that transactions have to get into uh, good reliably, right? Uh, so I think the yeah, most near-term thing that's going to happen in that regard is uh, MEV Boost is going to have uh, transaction inclusion lists uh, added to them, right? So this is the thing that uh, also has been called CR lists uh, sometimes, but the basic idea is that the uh, block proposer uh, provides a list of transactions and uh, whoever provides the uh, full uh, block as a builder would be required to include those uh, transactions or else the uh, proposer would not accept it, right? And uh, what that does is it kind of brings us back to the uh, world of uh, a world very similar to what uh, MEV Geth uh, did before the merge, right? Because uh, what MEV Geth uh, did before the merge is it did not provide full blocks, right? It provided uh, what's called bundles. And bundles are collections of transactions that can sometimes take up a, a full 30 million gas, but uh, very often they do not. And if they do not, then the uh, miner at the time um, you know, had the ability to just add whatever transactions uh, they want on top. And if there were any uh, transactions that, that the uh, bundlers were censoring, then the miners could just, uh, would even by default uh, basically end up adding them, right? And uh, the reason why that architecture did not carry over to MEV Boost by default is basically because there was a desire to reduce the uh, trust uh, dependencies, right? Because uh, the way that MEV Geth worked like, was really centralizing in a lot of subtle ways, right? Like it basically, yeah, 
required miners to be trusted, right? Because uh, if uh, you uh, put give a bundle to an untrusted miner, then or to, to a malicious miner, then that miner could do what's called MEV stealing. Like they could figure out what strategy is being used to extract MEV in the bundle, and then just like search and replace the address, collecting profit with their own, and just take all the money for themselves, right? And uh, the yeah, trust-based approach to mitigating that is basically, well, you know, only a few kind of big shot elite miners that uh, people knew and trusted would be yeah, whitelisted to participate in the system, which was like a kludgy compromise for the mo for that moment, but it really kind of sucked. And, uh, you know, MEV Boost was designed without that uh, idea in mind precisely because we don't want to be yeah, centralizing in that way, right? And uh, so it's much harder to create a yeah, system that gives proposers freedom to choose transactions for the purpose of uh, censorship resistance, but without uh, giving proposers the power to do MEV stealing. And uh, so the uh, simplest uh, MEV approach to, to doing it was to just uh, not bother with uh, giving proposers any uh, kind of control at all and just do all, well, what's called full block auctions, right? Where the builder just decides uh, everything. And that was MEV Boost 1.0. The next version has these inclusion lists where the yeah, transaction sender specifies a list of transactions. And then the yeah, builder can add their own, they can reorder transactions, but they can't like, remove the ones that the proposer included. And so that way we yeah, get back to this world where like, it doesn't look quite the same because uh, it's uh, like you don't have the proposer literally adding the transactions to the end. It's like the proposer provides them as a list and then the builder chooses the order. But you know, it's still a, a different uh, type of a partial block auction and proposers can't say, you know, hey, I know about these and I uh, absolutely want to get them included, right? So that's the first step and there's uh, more steps that are gonna happen after that too. Mm -hmm. You said that you're not worried about like 50% of the blocks being censored, even 90% would, would be okay. Where would you draw well, the line? Because I mean, it's kind yeah. of it's a slippery slope, no? It is, well, I mean, I would not say 90% is okay, right? I think, uh, I mean, the optimum is um, you know close to zero, right? Yeah. And uh, I think the question is not a kind of binary okay versus not okay. The question is, uh, if it happens, what kind of response are we uh, willing to do uh, to uh, try to change the situation, Yeah. right? Um, so, like one example of a yeah, response that I think would be too much, right, is you know doing what's called social slashing, right? Like which is this uh, meme that I think has actually gone too far, and we need to be yeah, you know really really careful about I think about saying those kinds of things because we yeah, don't want Ethereum validators or core devs to become a kind of general purpose morality police. But the basic idea would be like do a hard fork that you know deletes the balances of uh, validators we decide are censoring. Right? Like that's just. Uh, like that, that just kind of cuts through, um, you know, way too many norms and like it's emotionally appealing maybe, but it's just uh, like, it's just totally the kind of the wrong tier of escalation given the actual seriousness of uh, the yeah, situation, right? Which is like medium, but not fatal. Um, so the things that I do favor is, uh, you know, working harder at these uh, a kind of better MEV protocols if necessary, um, you know, trying uh, re like, socially leaning on, um, you know, specific stakers and validators to, and, you know, not use censoring technologies, even trying to, you know, give uh, grants to and subsidizing alternate builders and alternate relayers. Like there's a lot of uh, kind of ecosystem level, um, you know, tools in the toolbox that I think uh, we really should be using. And, you know, if the yeah, percent censoring goes up to 90, then, you know, we should obviously be, yeah, you know, using even more. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know, I, like, I'm uh, just optimistic that uh, things are going to improve quite a bit, even after some uh, simple counter measures. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Let me ask a question to kind of uh, mm -hmm. dig into that. Um, do you think validators should have agency? Because I think basically, mm -hmm. if if you de if you decline that, right? Mm -hmm. If you say like they're just um, they're mm -hmm. just a relay network, mm -hmm. um, and they should have no opinion, they should just you know mm -hmm. be switch. Right. Um, do, do you believe that, or do you think it's okay for them to be opinionated? It's a complicated topic. I think uh, different people inside of the uh, Ethereum Foundation even have different beliefs on this. I think our general approach so far has been to try to make validators as dumb pipey as possible, um, and uh, you know, basically have them just uh, you know, ideally run a run a piece of code that listens to the mempool, figures out which transactions to include, you know, uh, works with the uh, some kind of uh, builder auction uh, mechanism, and then just uh, chooses blocks. Um, and, you know, the, yeah, the benefit of uh, validators being uh, kind of maximally yeah, dumb pipey is like 
One is just um, you know more more predictability. Um, another is um, that it just it makes it easier to run a validator because if there is an expectation that validator is like a validator becomes this kind of um, you know even part time job where you have to actively seek out lots of things and make judgments, then uh, like it becomes an intense thing and that's just going to drive more people toward pooling, which uh, we want to avoid. Right. Uh, so, you know, we do want uh, like being a validator uh, to be kind of as uh, low resource as possible. And that's, uh, you know, both in the sense of uh, technical uh, resources and hardware, but also in the uh, sense of uh, human resources. Right. So that's kind of the uh, why validators uh, should have uh, low agency take the uh, argument for why, like at least the opportunity for agency for validators should exist is basically because like they are a second line of defense and we should use it, right? Like there is some mechanism that uh, gives um, you know, censorship or resistance by default because we did economic analysis and math that says that you know, blah, 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 the equilibrium is that you know, in order to prevent a transaction from getting in for n slots, you have to pay you know, like n times 100 or n squared or whatever. Um, but you know, if it turns out that like, whether because the math is wrong or whether because there is like some outside the model thing that we didn't realize that ends up not working, like it's really valuable to have the second line of defense where the portion of validators that are willing to, um, you know, both uh, kind of be more proactive and potentially sacrifice some profit are kind of have the room to uh, kind of wiggle and uh, you know, make sure that the uh, network's uh, guarantees are kept up, right? So that's the case for, I mean, like not demanding validators to be uh, opinionated, but at least, uh, you know, giving them the room to be opinionated if they uh, want to be, right? So I think it's, uh, a balance between those two. Mm -hmm. mm. In principle, the, one could think of technical ways to kind of enforce mm. um, validators to not be opinionated. For instance, kind of, you know, in this shutterized beacon chain scenario or, you know, commit reveal schemes. Mm. What do you think of those? Yeah. So, I mean, the challenge I have with a lot of these, uh, like, threshold encryption uh, based uh, schemes is like the reason why I don't trust uh, threshold encryption is because threshold encryption has a 50% honesty assumption and it has a particularly insidious 50% honesty assumption because 50% could collude to reveal all the information completely undetectably, right? Like if 50% in a threshold encrypt NPC secret chair, whatever you call it, uh, just, um, you know, all decide to send data to the NSA because the NSA leans on them, then like there is literally no way that anyone is going to find out about this. And you know, they easily could run some sub protocol that uh, kind of starts filtering particular things, right? So like, I mean, I'm like, I'm generally, uh, you know, suspicious of honesty majority assumptions and I'm always uh, big on, um, you know, having career paths to recovery, even if, um, you know, dishonest majorities become the case. But like, this just uh, feels even worse than honest majority assumptions where in, in order to do an attack, like, you know, you have to actually do something visible on the network, right? So like, that's uh, the reason why I'm uh, kind of skeptical of those particular solutions. And, um, you know, even on layer two networks, right? For example, like I think, uh, you know, even among flashbots people, a lot of them tends to even like prefer SGX to committees, basically yeah, exactly for that kind of a uh, reason, right? And uh, I mean, creating, like making sure that it's possible for layer two networks that do that sort of stuff and like maybe act as decentralized builders uh, to exist is uh, I think definitely interesting. Um, there, I should also mention there are other ways to force uh, pro like validators in their capacity as proposers to be unopinionated that don't involve like threshold stuff. Uh, so. MEV smoothing, this is uh, Justin Drake's favorite idea, is probably the biggest one there, right? The idea there is basically that uh, a testers by default, um, like if they uh, see that a proposal uh, voted on a, yeah, or accepted a bid that is um, like significantly cheaper than the yeah, actual winning bid, then they would like act as though that block did not actually appear, right? So like they would basically treat a sort of non-optimal bid acceptance as a kind of um, invalidity or unavailability condition, which is uh, I mean, interesting and uh, potentially sort of scary in unknown unknown way, ways in different ways, because like that also uh, starts making a testers be yeah, less uh, dumb pipey. Um, and uh, 
it also like it, it does go way down the spectrum of uh, removing agency from proposers, right? Where like even it, where even if profit maximization uh, kind of stopped working toward the yeah, goal of uh, censorship resistance, like they would just not be able to do anything to uh, uh, counteract that. And so that's. Uh, but you know, I'm sure Justin would have uh, kind of other er, arguments in favor, and you know, if you talk to him, I'm sure he'll you know he'll give great arguments. So I think, uh, I think stepping back a bit, there's just uh, you know lots of different considerations, like lots of uh, strategies are still up to debate. And so I think in the yeah, short to uh, medium uh, term, we want to take approaches that are forward compatible with as many likely paths as possible uh, just uh, so that you know we don't end up taking uh, a particular path and just realizing like oh my god we just uh, you know completely screwed ourselves and uh, then uh, wasting a year on uh, going back if it ends up uh, leading to the chain uh, censoring really heavily mm -hmm. mm. are you worried that this will progress in ways other than the number of blocks being censored so for instance what i could Im imagine mm -hmm. is that um, attestors all of a sudden say, look, mm -hmm. this, this block has a tornado cash transaction mm -hmm. in it. I will not attest to it. And I mean, obviously, that would cause, you know, a whole different set of network problems. Right. Okay. Well, so one very subtle thing about attestors that I think people don't talk about enough, right, is that, like, you, there's the, the legal bar to preventing, uh, you know, speech and, um, you know, even including a kind of, you know, speech that is actually by computer programs is high. But the bar to compelled speech is way higher, right? And as an attester, you actually have three options. Mm -hmm. One option is to attest to the, uh, you know, the block that uh, contains controversial transactions. The second is to attest to the main competing block. And the third is to not attest at all, right? And I'm not aware of any legal argument for why the second would be man mandated. The third is always an option, right? And once you start, you know, not attesting at all, then, well, there's different ways you could do it, right? You could start not just you know, being quiet until the uh, block, until a censoring block or until a block containing controversial transactions uh, gets uh, 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 confirmed, and then you go back. Or if that becomes untenable, then you know, as of elder, you just exit, right? And I, uh, I do think that a lot of uh, stakers and even the the big staking pools, uh, they are well-meaning, and um, you know, if uh, it comes down to it and they get get leaned on uh, that hard, a lot of them would be yeah willing to uh, just uh, exit and leave. But you know, if they don't, then like the good news is that we have a very kind of clear uh, technical definition of like what it means to be uh, uh, to be fit, like kind of attempted fifty one percent attacking the chain, right? And that attempted uh, that definition is basically if proposals that appear on time get, uh, do not become uh, become part of the canonical chain, right? So if a proposal appears on time, uh, but then other blocks uh, start winning, then like clearly the majority of attesters did not vote for the head that they were supposed to vote for, and like that's the yeah, situation where you can st uh, you know you can start doing the kind of user activated soft forks and inactivity leaks and you know all, all kinds of these uh, kind of more extreme mechanisms. Mm -hmm. mm. I hope they never happen. Um, I hope so too, but I think like <laughs> it's good it, to have them. I mean, it's it's, so. it's kind of like nuclear deterrence, right? In the sense that like having a very clear story about how to respond, and like w it itself may may well be the deciding factor in ensuring we never have to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of like the maker shutdown. Mm -hmm. you, you you know that yeah. in principle you could trigger it. Right. Um, so you already touched upon it, MEB. How much of, of a problem do you think it is, and who should mm. solve it? <clears throat> MEV is interesting because there's many kinds of MEV and like some of it is a problem and some of it is not a problem and some of it is a yeah, problem of different kinds, right? So I think uh, there's different classes of MEV problems that people tend to identify, right? So one class of problem, for example, is just uh, like outright exploitation, right? So I send a Uniswap transaction, I want to tr uh, convert one ETH to uh, um, you know, 1200 uh, USDC mm -hmm. and uh, uh, someone, um, you know, some MEV builder front runs and like, kind of does a sandwich attack where they sell some uh, US, uh, some ETH first and then they buy back at the end and um, you know, I get like 5% less USDC, right? So that's one example of uh, MEV which is like completely harmful and it would be cool if like somehow it could be eliminated entirely, right? The uh, second kind of uh, MEV is MEV that is uh, to some extent, unavoidable and is probably even benign. 
So one example of this is just arbitrage, right? So like if, uh, you know, in, in the most recent block on Uniswap, the ETH USDC price is at 1220, uh, but then within those uh, 12 seconds, um, you know, the price on Binance or whatever shot up to 1227, then, you know, you could do a little, um, you know, Uniswap trade, make uh, kind of get that transaction in as the first transaction in the next block. And then you'd do the, you know, so you would uh, kind of buy up a bit of ETH and then you'd sell some ETH on Binance and like, you know, you'd make a couple of uh, dollars of arbitrage profits, right? So that type of MEV is uh, like, it's not in abuse of anyone and it's even good because it keeps prices synchronized. But it's MEV in general still leads to this issue of economies of scale and block production, right? Where you need sophisticated algorithms to produce optimal blocks. And uh, these algorithms change a lot. And like, we really, really don't want uh, proposers to have to uh, you know, like update their software to stay in touch with all of these uh, opti uh, you know, algorithms that are trying to optimize MEV. And uh, the solution with uh, you know, PBS, whether it's uh, kind of MEV boost style extra protocol stuff, whether it's Ethereum in protocol stuff or whatever, is to try to like, you know, create two different classes of actors and try to uh, kind of keep builders as decentralized as possible and try to ensure, um, you know, censorship resistance even, or sorry, keep proposals as decentralized as possible and try to ensure censorship resistance even in the case where uh, builders get very centralized. Yeah, and I mean, we, we've we've kind of, we have been seeing that uh, builders have gotten very centralized, right? Yes. So. Uh... Do you think it's it's um, a problem that apps in principle have to solve? Do you think this is on the app mm -hmm. that the user, because mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. to a user, mm -hmm. um, first of all, any one user, it's mm -hmm. not usually not that much money. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. a percent or so. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's a lot in aggregate, but for every single one, mm -hmm. it's not that much. Yeah. Um, do, do you think we should make the dApps understand that they have to build a process that is MEV resistant in the best case? So I think, uh, like we can't count on all dApps uh, becoming uh, you know, good from an MEV point of view because there's just like, there's always going to be dumb developers somewhere, right? And uh, you know, those uh, dumb developers are going to cause like, you know, base fees, splats and MEV and uh, all sorts of things. And the chain just needs to be able to absorb that, right? Like if the chain can just be, yeah, you know, taken down by yeah, a couple of idiots that use a, a bad auction mechanism to sell their monkeys, then like it's not actually a very robust chain, right? But from the app, the, the interesting question is like from the app's point of view, like, is it, I guess, more socially optimal for the apps to take charge on uh, reducing or redesigning themselves to reduce MEV because that's in their interest? Or is it better to have some kind of, you know, more, uh, more abstract, higher layer, possibly protocol level, possibly some middleware mm -hmm. that uh, prevents uh, that value from uh, kind of disappearing or into, I mean, you know, exploitative MEV actors' hands or whatever. Yeah. And I think there is, uh, the interesting thing is that both paths exist, right? So. Like just continuing the Uniswap example, because I think realistically Uniswap style things are basically are like 90% of the uh, MEV that's uh, going on like generally, with the exception of spikes. Like, um, you know, there was uh, that like Zen thing that uh, pushed the base fee up and I'm not sure what that, what, what that even is. And then like the, the monkey thing that caused like 60,000 ETH uh, to get burned uh, earlier, uh, earlier this year and so forth. But in the Uniswap case, um, like one approach is the cow swap route, right? Like you make a, a better alternative to union swap where the order is an off-chain object and you first make a best effort at off-chain matching. And if the uh, off-chain matching doesn't happen, then as a backup, you uh, go on chain and you do the swap, right? So that's a very uh, MEV minimizing architecture because in the average case, you get an off-chain swap. And so there isn't a way to like make money by sandwiching or even back running it, right? So now we could also consider the other strategy, right? So let's uh, just for the sake of example, remove sandwiching, right? And uh, let's say the uh, sender sets a uh, slippage of zero. And um, let's also, you know, let's say with fancy account abstraction, it, 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 in some you know, far future, it becomes safe to have a slippage of zero because uh, if that transaction doesn't get it uh, included, like you don't even have to pay a fee. Um, so you know, nobody even will bother to include it. The yeah, other thing that happens is back running, right? So like if, for example, I'm selling, I don't know, 100 ETH and converting it to a USDC. That trade by itself might decrease the price of ETH on the uh, AMM by let's say 2%, right? And, and so on average, I'm losing 1% uh, on the trade. So what happens is that creates a back running opportunity, right? That basically means that after my trade, the price is 2% uh, uh, out of balance. And so someone else 
can come and make a Uniswap purchase in the opposite direction uh, to buy back some uh, ETH. And then on Binance, they can go sell some ETH and uh, you know they can uh, make an arbitrage profit that is uh, assuming optimal everything uh, going to be equal to the uh, 1% uh, slippage uh, that I lose, right? Yeah. So what you could do is you could potentially come up with some auction mechanism where, you know, using weird fancy stuff, um, you could uh, uh, basically say, yeah, I'm, you know, oh, f basically find a, yeah, like auction off the right to learn about this opportunity to background me. And in an optimal auction that would get sold for, uh, um, you know, close to the, yeah, the the one percent that I lose, and so I will. I as a user would get most of the revenue from the auction, and so I would get most of my money back. Right. Mm -hmm. So, both of those strategies are legit, and both of those strategies could maybe work. But that second one requires, you know, a lot of uh, fancy infrastructure work. But on the other hand, it doesn't require per application work. But then, you know, if you do the per application work, then it's like harder on each individual application, but you don't need to do things to kind of complicate the de facto protocol stack that people uh, use to send the transactions through to Ethereum. Uh, so that's how I view the trade-off. I guess the uh, instinctive answer there is like apps would probably uh, take the responsibility on themselves to minimize MEV in the short term. And then in the longer term, we can uh, come up with these more kind of general purpose and all-encompassing solutions. Yeah, I, I, I like that uh, hmm. idea. How do you feel about um, this attempted and in, in, in some way also successful narrative shift that you know, the very smart people at like Paradigm and uh, Flashbots and so on pushed that basically um, extracting MEV is good for the network because it secures it. Hmm. I feel like it's a really weird spin. And I mm -hmm. think people, if, if, if you onboard mm -hmm. someone and you right. tell them about this, this is not the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, conclusion that people usually would go to. Yeah, right? yeah no, I, mean, I, I get it. Like I get how like, you know, it's uh, to an outside observer, like it could feel isomorphic to how, you know, Philip Morris has these uh, lovely um, ads and websites to talk about how they're making the yeah, future of, um, you know, like a, a post a cigarette a smoking that's going to be much healthier or whatever. And the, yeah, you know, the reality is different but i guess the uh, arguments from uh, their point of view, from their point of view if i had to uh, i think i would explain it like uh, one mev is uh, inevitable and in particular if they did not step in to try to extract uh, that mev in a reasonably uh, decentralization preserving way then it would have been extracted in a way that's much worse right and i have heard things about how even a couple of years ago there were mining pools that were seriously looking into um, having uh, internal teams that would do mev extraction and so if flashbots type people never existed and never kind of democratized mev extraction then you know the argument is that uh, the uh, MEV, the, the big mining pools will just get more profitable because they have these fancy internal teams and that would just like, centralize Ethereum to hell and uh, we would not even have an answer to this uh, post-merge and like even post-merge, uh, everyone will just consolidate into the biggest staking pool, right? So that's probably the uh, kind of divide there, right? Like uh, to the extent so that MEV is inevitable. It's like it's better that it gets captured in a yeah, way that preserves decentralization and is an open protocol and uh, you know give is a neutral between um, you know small uh, stakers and big stakers. But then you know the I guess the yeah, argument against that argument is like well you know is intellectual energy being pushed into um, a kind of optimizing fair MEV redistribution that could have instead been pushed into making protocols that are not as MEV in the first place. And that's like, it's a good argument to have. And I think it's definitely good that there's a kind of the skeptics in the community that are uh, really yeah, pushing hard and uh, making the argument. Um, but I think, uh, you know, to what extent each side is right ultimately ends up depending on like really complicated technical considerations, right? So like, one example of a technical consideration is that let's suppose that we had magic delay encryption where you can encrypt data and uh, it would be guaranteed that um, you know after six uh, seconds, um, so you know six times uh, 9.3 trillion vibrations of a cesium atom or whatever the <laughs> physics definition of a second is, um, you know it, the yeah, data would get decrypted, right? Then you could like well we would be able to very easily just um, you know, have delay encryption baked into the protocol. And then when you send a, snar a transaction, it would come with um, you know, 
some kind of snark that proves that uh, if it gets included, it pays a fee. And uh, you know, you'll get included, and then everything else is encrypted. And then once a while later, it would get decrypted. And uh, that would be extremely MEV minimizing, and that would like make everyone happy, right? But the problem yeah. is that there's all of these uh, kind of technical considerations, and like you know, we don't actually have magic delay encryption and all the substitutes that we have are imperfect in various ways. And so, you know, depending on how the technology yeah, sorts itself out, I think the yeah, end uh, result is going to be some combination of the two. You said one thing I want to take issue with. Okay. Do you think Flashbots, mm -hmm. by and large, has been a factor for decentralization in the ecosystem? Because to me, it mm. looks the it looks like the exact mm. converse. Mm. I think they mm. yeah, have uh, they have successfully prevented decentralization of the layer under them, which mm -hmm. is which is uh, my uh, stakers, and I think that's really important because that's like the one thing that's much more difficult to reverse. But you know, on the other hand, Flashbots itself has uh, definitely yeah, turned into a yeah, centralization vector, and um, you know they, yeah, you know they, they they have their own narrative about how this is uh, going. They they really want to improve this over time, but I definitely think the yeah, community should also uh, take charge and, uh, and kind of push really hard for you know both uh, things like MEV boost and uh, trying to support uh, competing builders and relays and just like you know basically all of the yeah, tools in the toolbox to try to ensure a more distributed market. And so you know I think that stuff's really important too. Cool. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, I'm done with the meaty stuff. Shall we go on to the fishy stuff? Sure. Okay, fantastic. Mm. Um, Ethereum core development. Okay. Fantastic. So um, <clears throat> we all know, you know, the mm. merge, the surge, the verge, the purge, the splurge. I, mm -hmm. Probably not the right order. But did you know that rhyming mm -hmm. is a veracity signaler? Because it kind of, it, it says to you, oh yeah, that makes sense. That checks out our rhymes. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very convincing. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about the surge first. So dank sharding requires a trusted setup. Right. Right? Should mm -hmm. we worry about that? Um, I mean, lots of people have different opinions. I mean, my opinion is that it's a yeah, one of N trust assumption where N is uh, going to be in the thousands. And so it's, that's m much less likely to be the thing that breaks than like 10 other things in the ecosystem. But like at the same time, you know, I recognize uh, both the yeah, like the fact that even that like one event assumption is still uh, worse than a yeah, zero assumption, and the fact that like you know people value aesthetic purity, and that is important. And I do think that it is uh, it is important to try to move away from the yeah, trusted setup uh, based approach over time. So I did do that uh, deep dive into uh, you know we we looked into IPAs at the yeah, Stanford uh, event, and then I did my deep dive into uh, whether or not we could replace uh, the whole thing with uh, arithmetic hash functions and try to like upgrade to snarks or starks over them. And the challenge is that all of the other approaches just uh, have too many trade-offs, and um, you know they don't quite fit nicely in the same way. And so it just feels like um, you know all things considered, uh, the yeah, KZG trusted setup-based uh, approach is like, the least bad of um, all possible worlds, and uh, from a trust point of view, you know, keep in mind that like, if like, if we don't do something, then the risk is that uh, like, the yeah, mentality will entrench that um, you know instead of uh, it being best to do things on rollups, it's like oh you know it's okay to use external data availability committees, and so you know if we don't uh, like really take seriously the desire to have some kind of a good and uh, you know very uh, strong and effective uh, scalability on the Ethereum base layer, then like this other layer could easily uh, uh, kind of centralize and uh, lose uh, trust assumptions in a way that's uh, irreversible, right? So that's kind of the argument for pushing ahead with KZG4844 now. Um, there are, I think, a lot of things that we've done to try to make it be forward compatible with a uh, speedy replacement uh, with uh, something better mm -hmm. when the uh, time comes, right? So. Uh, Probably the biggest example of this is the yeah, point evaluation precompile, right? The idea here is basically that there is this precompile which uh, lets you uh, verify the yeah, kind of 
the evaluation of the blob if you treat the blob as a polynomial at a particular point, right? Mm -hmm. And that lets you, like, that's a general purpose facility that allows ZK rollups to use blobs as a data source, and uh, it allows optimistic rollups to also use point evaluation to kind of point to particular locations for a fraud proof, right? Because fraud proofs these days, Optimism and Arbitrum both use multi-round uh, proofs, and so they can just uh, you know f uh, focus on uh, one value, right? But the nice thing about making that be a precompile is that it lets us seamlessly upgrade the cryptography that's used to manage the whole thing without rollups needing to change a line of code, right? So today, KZG gets used, and uh, point evaluation is a KZG Yamino pairing. Uh, you know, you provide a G2 element, but in the future. You know, it's going to be maybe a Poseidon Merkle root, maybe a reinforced uh, concrete Merkle root, some maybe a you know Poseidon over a 64-bit field uh, Merkle root because uh, uh, I hear Poseidon over a 64-bit field is, is like insanely fast now, and the cryptography is going to be totally different. But because rollups are going to use it through this black boxy way, they're not going to need to even change their code at all, and uh, you know it'll be just done in this uh, way where it's just completely yeah, seamless for them and you know we can make that upgrade in a future hard fork right so that's kind of both uh, you know why we're doing the kcg thing now and also the yeah, roadmap for getting off of it once uh, you know better snark technology really catches up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And maybe let's talk about um, the the road towards dank sharding, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, um, back in the day, um, mm -hmm. we thought that um, shards would be smart and mm -hmm. they would, uh, you know, like have mm -hmm. compute. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, the Ethereum has kind of moved away from that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, has mm -hmm. see uh, basically shards are now basically mm -hmm. it's a data availability solution mm -hmm. mostly, yeah. right? Do you feel? Um, how do you feel about that move? Because one could argue that basically the, the use case mm -hmm. for Ethereum of distributed compute, um, mm -hmm. this is proven, whereas mm -hmm. data availability mm -hmm. is not. And mm -hmm. there's also other solutions out there that mm -hmm. could have been you know, integrated, right? Well, are there though? Be, like the pro like sharded EVM execution is uh, theoretically possible, but uh, doing it in ways that preserve good assumptions is not really doable without working ZK VMs, which is not something that we had before, right? Because like, if we just said, okay, you know, we're gonna have 64 shards, and each of these shards is gonna have an EVM inside of it, then like, there's a lot of complexity that actually multiplies, right? Like, one, you have to have an in-protocol facility for a cross shard communication, and you know, cross shard ETH transfers and all of that. Absolutely. Yep. Um, then two, uh, you have to deal with the question of like, what if something wrong happens in one of the shards and it doesn't get caught because everyone only verifies a small portion of the data. And if you rely on fraud proofs, then you're adding synchrony, uh, asynchrony assumption to, uh, to the chain's safety property, which, well, if, which like, if we're willing to do that, then like, what's the point of even having finality, right? If we're mm -hmm. willing to make safety dependent on synchrony, then we just give up on finality and you know, just like, you know, block a test, block a test, and we just like, kill half of our uh, consensus spec code, and like, you know, lots of people would be happy. Um, but uh, we, so, with a ZK Snarks, I mean, you just completely solved that issue because you actually would be able to like prove the validity of EVM stuff um, happening in real time, right? But when the rollup centric pivot was made, ZK EVMs were still very far away, and uh, the uh, Ethereum core development process was uh, very yeah kind of tight, you know, was pretty much you know like fully occupied with uh, both uh, you know the merge and fifteen fifty nine and other things, right? So. Like one of the reasons why I think we've been preferring a lot of these uh, kind of outside of protocol approaches to a lot of problems is because like core developer bandwidth is limited, and if we can solve problems and iterate on solutions outside the protocol, then it's just much easier than doing it inside. Um, ERC four three three seven um, account abstraction is another good example of this, right? Like the uh, our strategy for account abstraction before was uh, ERC two nine three eight, which uh, basically uh, um, Attempted to do kind of the same thing 4337 does, except like sticking everything into the protocol and uh, like adding a whole bunch of complexity into the protocol to verify, you know, that ver the uh, verification process of a transaction is not like accessing anything on the outside and, you know, this and that and that. And it would have taken a long uh, time for Core Dust to implement, and it probably, yeah, I mean, it would have delayed EIP one five five nine and or the merge by, um, you know, half a year or a year, you know, you know, some pretty crazy amount, right? 
So if, you know, but on the other hand, ERC-4337 is this uh, extra protocol thing. It's something that exists, um, you know, th basically thanks to uh, proposer builder separation, right? Like it would be builders that add uh, the 4337 user operations into a uh, transaction that goes into a bundle. And uh, because of that, there's just been this lovely community that's just solving it in a way that's totally separate from the core dev process, right? You know, you have, you know, Yoav and Jaror and the Infin Infinitism team and uh, the Soul Wallet people have been, uh, you know, really stepping up at and, and uh, making an implementation and kind of popularizing and doing a lot of community work around it. And there's multiple panels on it. And like 4337 is sort of really blossoming into this massive ecosystem. and. Uh, will even be able to deploy it on layer two is before layer one, right? And uh, there is even a compelling case for it on layer two is because the uh, signature aggregation feature of 4337 um, lets you, uh, you know, combine all the signatures of, uh, uh, of the accounts if there be a lot of signatures into one and uh, on uh, rollups, the data is the most expensive thing. And so transactions become like two times cheaper, right? So that sort of stuff, um, it, like in the case of account abstraction, right? That's the benefit of uh, kind of spinning things off into an ERC. And rollups are the exact, uh, I think, same argument, but for the yeah, ten times harder problem, which is uh, scaling, right? And I think it's been successful so far. Like uh, the yeah, rollups are you know, very mature in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, obviously there are some things that are behind, right? Like the it has taken them longer than I've hoped to take off training wheels, but you know, some have, right? Like the yeah, some some of the Starcore systems have taken off training wheels. Fuel has uh, taken off uh, training wheels, and uh, I think uh, you know we are going to start to see kind of partial um, removals of training wheels uh, start happening over the next uh, year. So, you know, the benefit of uh, dink sharding as a whole is basically that, you know, it lets us uh, split off the yeah, development effort and uh, the problem core developers have to solve as a, a much simpler problem and uh, the remaining work gets uh, shunted off to a, yeah, and a very separate and uh, increasingly amazing uh, community of uh, rollup developers. And also it allows us to really keep the uh, Ethereum based protocol um, much simpler and um, you know, get something out, uh, I think, uh, much faster. It also moves a lot of the value accrual to like third party uh, for profit companies, right? This is true. Um, I mean, there are costs to this and there are benefits to this, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, one of the benefits is that, uh, you know, if we have non ETH tokens in the uh, Ethereum ecosystem, then, you know, those tokens could contribute to public goods funding, right? So, mm -hmm. OP is probably the best example of that. Um, and uh, I think, um, you know, they've uh, really yeah, uh, kind of taken the uh, kind of theory and philosophy around public goods funding to like a really amazing level. But, you know, there's other examples of things like this in the Ethereum ecosystem, right? Like the uh, Uniswap DAO has, uh, has a huge amount of funding and it's uh, independent from the Ethereum Foundation. And so it, like that by itself has uh, significantly uh, increased the uh, on uh, funding decentralization in the uh, Ethereum community. Um, so those are benefits, but the uh, costs are, yeah, like uh, some portion of the uh, fees uh, definitely yeah, you know, goes to other people and uh, some portion of that could have otherwise gone to ETH holders. But like, you know, I don't think ETH holders should be the only people who benefit from all these people's hard work, you know? Sure. Meher Roy um, had a thread this morning on Twitter um, talking about how Basically, if we took the base fee and didn't and wouldn't burn it, uh, but instead kind of put it towards roll up like Ethereum Foundation based roll up development, um, you know, we could have an Ethereum based layer two uh, that's not propri proprietary. Mm, so the concept of um, like in protocol issuance going mm -hmm. to specific development teams. Like this is something that has been brought up before and this is something that has been pretty soundly rejected, right? Yeah. Like um, I think it was EAP 2025 or like somewhere close to that, there was an attempt to make a, a uh, an issuance of uh, 0 0.045 ETH per block that would go to the ETH 1.X team. And that just got, uh, you know, shouted down really hard. And uh, like the reason is basically that like, you know, we're trying to minimize governance, not maximize it, right? And, um, you know, we uh, want the governance load of the chain to go down over time. We don't, we definitely don't want the chain uh, to, um, you know, become legally classified as some kind of economic political agent that uh, we uh, don't want, uh, 
the, yeah, the core developers, um, they've been insistent in a whole bunch of contexts that they want their role to be as narrowly technical as possible. And they're just, uh, you know, very fearful of uh, making these uh, kind of social value judgments that are going to inevitably leave uh, lots of people very angry at, um, at them because, uh, you know, they, uh, they do a tough job and, um, you know, like way too many people are angry at them for lots of things already. Um, so there's, a, I think, a very understandable desire by all parts of the uh, Ethereum ecosystem to like really value credible neutrality of uh, Ethereum and ETH. And uh, that is uh, something that's, uh, that probably prevents that from being a solution. I mean, you know, if we had a magic wand and could go back eight years in the past and, um, you know, like pre-mine an extra three million ETH and have that go into <laughs> a long-term fund that gets... Uh, eventually governed by soul bound tokens and uh, you know whatever whatever like maybe but like we have to live with um, you know the uh, ethereum e ecosystem as it is today and like the closest that we have uh to being able to kind of benefit from um you know token based uh, public goods funding is like basically yeah, allowing these uh, layer twos with uh, separate uh, layer two revenue streams to prosper mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Um, now, maybe if, if we look at layer twos and compare them to um, to layer ones that are connected via trustless bridges, so kind mm -hmm. of the ZK-like client bridges mm -hmm. that we've seen recently, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of more of the mm -hmm. IBC model, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a cost, cost modification of the yeah. Ethereum mm -hmm. ecosystem. How do you see that in comparison to um, the real layer twos? Yeah, I mean, well, I think that the big difference between those two models is like whether or not you have shared security, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Ethereum has uh, shared security and it also has this uh, like really nice tight coupling property that basically says that like the states of the different things that live inside and commit to um, Ethereum it are going to be kind of compatible with each other, even if Ethereum gets 51% attacked, right? Like, mm -hmm. even if there is a massive reversion, even if something terrible happens, the, uh, like, you're not going to, like, you, you, you might be able to revert some things, but you're not going to be able to cause an inconsistency, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have chains of separate governance, then, like, first of all, you know, you could try to, uh, and try to concentrate and uh, take out one without taking out the others. Then there's a question of, you know, what there is, what if there's some internal political dispute inside of one that leads to a hard fork, but not the others. And uh, there, um, like, there's just kind of more of that kind of, uh, I guess, security concern friction with uh, any kind of uh, interoperability with uh, that model. Um, so. But yeah, like basically, the, yeah, the argument is like, um, you know, one is like every blockchain is uh, like a country, but the other is like, um, you know, every blockchain is uh, like a country, but they're all part of, but they're all part of the same defensive alliance. Mm -hmm. And I guess Ethereum has kind of committed itself to that approach. And then, of course, there's the, yeah, you know, you, you could go even further and uh, kind of take the yeah, extreme of saying, well, you know, now we're going to kind of force all the countries to merge with each other and make a really big, big superpower, which is uh, the, yeah. I guess the equivalent of kind of the yeah, you know ultra big layer ones. Um, so yeah, there's a spectrum, and like there's uh, costs and benefits on all sides of the spectrum. And I guess uh, you know Ethereum has uh, chosen the yeah costs and the benefits of the middle road at this point. That's fair. Um, but but the security mm -hmm. assumption on layer twos. This mm -hmm. is only for tokens that are bridge, right? It's not for natively issued tokens on layer twos, right? Why wouldn't it be though? Because you can't you can't. Uh, mm. You can't force an exit, right? Why can't you force an exit? Because there's there's not necessarily a representation. A representation of what? Of the token on on mainnet. Right. So you're saying if there's a token where kind of the home base of the token is on yeah. optimism, then well, I mean, it's, I think like if uh, like we get to the point where optimism is fully trustless, uh, mm -hmm. then. Uh, no, like, you, no, you just, uh, you know, you make a copy of, uh, like, you make a wrapper of, uh, like, uh, of your token on Optimus, of your token that is um, based in Arbitrum, and you make a wrapper that's based in the mainnet, and you make a wrapper that's based everywhere else. Like, it's basically just, it's equivalent to a sharded system, right? Like, you just, uh, like, you have wrapper tokens on all the domains, and it does, it almost doesn't matter which domain is the home domain eventually. Like this, this is assuming that the home domain is governance minimized. I think you, you do want the yeah, home domain of a token you issue to be governance minimized. But aside from that. I think I have to think about that, but I take your word for it for now. Um, what about centralized choke points in layer mm -hmm. twos? So basically, mm -hmm. they typically, this, at least 
at the very least, the sequencer in mm -hmm. all layer twos that I'm familiar mm -hmm. with is still very much centralized, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So decentralizing the sequencer is uh, very important, right? And uh, I think there is a couple of different steps on that roadmap, right? So the first is that like Optimism already has implemented, and I'm not sure, maybe Arbitrum already has this, but I don't know. It's like this concept of backup channels, right? Like there is an alternate way to send an Ethereum. Like anyone can send an Ethereum transaction that contains a bunch of Optimism transactions and the yeah, rules of the Optimism protocol force those transactions to be considered and to be yeah, applied to the state within some amount of time. I think it might be within the next 10 minutes or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that already means that even if the sequencer wants to censor, the sequencer can't censor. So that's step one. But then step two is I think that's insufficient and you do want to make these systems be independent of a central operator. And for that, you have to decentralize the sequencer, right? And I think there is uh, different approaches to decentralizing the yeah, sequencer. Right. Um, so, one example of uh, this is um, that you know you could make an in protocol auction where you just like make an auction for um, you know you could just do a descending price auction if you want to make the auction cheap and like limited to um, you know one transaction per winning bid where you just kind of you know buy up the right to be the sequencer for some future swap. Um, so that's a, a simple approach, and then you can. Uh, change it around. You could say instead of one future slot, it could be 100 uh, future slots or 50 future slots. You could even say, oh, it's going to be 100 slots, but then there is governance that could kick you out if you uh, uh, do things that are abusive, like, sand uh, like making sandwich attacks earlier. Um, so that's one route. Another route is that you could um, start, uh, like, you could basically have, um, you know, an in protocol proposer mechanism that's like very similar to what Ethereum does, right? But then, you know, you have this question of like, how do you handle MV extraction? And then, you know, are you going to need an auction mechanism on top of that? Um, and uh, another thing you could do is you could do a kind of, uh, you know, hybrid uh, kind of proposer and layer two attester design, right? So this is uh, if you want to keep the concept of pre confirmations and you want to keep them trustworthy. Then you have like a bunch of attesters that are, you know, let's say in the case of optimism, it would be OP token holders, or it could be, yeah, you know, citizens or whatever, and uh, you, they would have to sign off on like every micro block that a sequencer makes, right? Mm -hmm. So sequencer makes a micro block, two thirds of the yeah, attesters sign off. Sequencer makes a micro block, two thirds of the attesters sign off. The nice thing is that you don't even need a complicated tenderment. Like all you need is just the, the, the kind of the dumb consensus algorithm that says that like the thing is fine if two thirds of people agree on it, and like you know one third gets slashed if they yes sign on competing things. Mm -hmm. The reason you don't need a full consensus algorithm is because full consensus algorithms are harder because they have like they they work in the case where like there's nothing else to appeal to if there's a disagreement. But in this case, like there is something else to appeal to if there's a disagreement, which is, which is the chain, right? So. That's another kind of approach. And then another approach might be is that, you know, if someone makes a really good decentralized builder, then, um, you know, you could just like make them be the sequencer. Um, you could even have an auction market between and, like try to only accept decentralized builders as uh, sequencers. So there's a bunch of approaches. There's like a bunch of tools in the toolbox. I think the challenge is like, how quickly can you get to something that is significantly better than the yeah, status quo that we have today? And that's like, you know, they have to balance lots of complicated constraints, right? Like there's uh, minimum, like specific security constraints, there's optics constraints, there's legal constraints and all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, they yeah, know how to balance all of those issues much better than I do. But you know, I'm, I'm hoping they, we can get there soon. Do you venture to make a guess on how soon? No, in, mm. in like, you know, months or years? <laughs> Good question. I think, uh, well, obviously the rollups have a prioritization challenge uh, between mm -hmm. The two problems that are have a kind of similar spirit, but they're doing different things, right? Which is uh, uh, decentralizing the sequencer and taking off the training wheels. And uh, I mean, there's you know there's this challenging question of like which one do you uh, spend more effort on? And I think uh, one of the challenging things is that from a yeah, like protecting users' funds point of view, like prioritizing having safe uh, training, uh, safe uh, fraud proofs or ZK proofs and uh, reducing or removing the training wheels is more important. But then, you know, I don't know, it's possible that from a legal point of view, decentralizing the sequencer ends up getting prioritized by some of them. But, mm -hmm. you know, or hopefully they, yeah, you know, have enough resources to have two separate teams, right? Because uh, like 
especially when resources are not your constraints, right? Like the, the best way to improve productivity is to kind of split a problem in half and make sure those halves don't have to talk to each other, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, you know, over the next couple of years, uh, we are going to see uh, very serious improvements on both. Okay, and when dank sharding? So dank sharding is interesting because it's like inherently this multi-phase thing, right? So phase one of dank sharding is a uh, proto dank sharding, aka EIP four eight four four, and uh, that like people really want it to be in, um, you know, early to mid next year, but you know that could get delayed more. Um, the good news is that the EIP is basically finished, and um, you know there even I think are like basic DevNet implementations of it, and the trust ceremony is uh, started, and uh, so it looks like we're pretty far. But you know at the same time there's still a lot of uh, work left to be done. Um, so yeah, I know it depends. Uh, like yeah. optimi optimistic <clears throat> spring, pessimistic fall, but you know we'll see. Yeah. So that's phase one. Then phase two of Dank sharding is. Uh, how do we, um, you know, go from one megabyte to sixteen megabytes, and how do we actually like sp start splitting up the data load? That gets more complicated, and uh, you know, there we have to deal with issues of like, you know, what is the data availability sampling going to look like? You know, is it going to be a peer-to-peer -peer network, or might it be dependent on like some one of trusted super node thing at the beginning? Um, might and then you know decentralize more over time. Are we going to? One of the things I think we're with uh, data availability sampling is that I don't think we're going to see an all at once transition. I think we're going to see some nodes uh, transition to sampling over time, and um, you know possibly like the big rich people are going to keep downloading full data, and then you know start off with twenty percent of the network sampling, and then forty, and then sixty, and as that happens, the uh, total cap on the number of uh, blob transactions and like the megabytes might increase, you know, slowly from the current one all the way up to sixteen, and then um, even higher. You know, so. I think it's going to be a, a very multi-stage thing, um, both in terms of the uh, you know trust assumptions and the percentage of the nodes that are participating, and just like, all kinds of uh, considerations. I want to skip over the verge and the splurge and so on. I think we'll just do an interview with another cool dev at some point. Um, but I do actually have a big picture mm -hmm. uh, question to kind of end with. Mm. Um, so when you look at this space. The number of hacks, mm. right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's three billion this year alone, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the uh, possibility space for future hacks is only getting larger by introducing all this zk technology, right? Because mm. in, I mean, in principle, you you can't read. There's there's going to be bugs in uh, in, mm. in that. So, how how do we get to a point where we can, um, in good conscience, kind of roll this out to the normies? Mm. It's a big challenge. Um, it's, uh, a, I mean, it's a challenge I um, actually talked about at Rollup Day a couple of uh, days ago, right? In, specifically in the zk case, that uh, like there's going to be a long period of time between when we have zk EVMs that look good and they're available, and uh, you know they make polynomials that you know look legit, uh, to the time when we can actually trust that they uh, are really, really robust and they're like as windy as um, you know hash functions are or whatever. And but within that time, I think. Uh, there's different routes that we can take. Like one of the things that I'm a fan of is the kind of multiple implementations approach, right? So, you know, we have multiple ZKVMs, so we don't need to standardize on a single one, right? Like, you know, different uh, clients can have different ZKVMs, and you can have uh, Ethereum blocks, um, you know, going around with different proofs attached to them. And uh, within a rollup, like you know, you can literally have like a yeah. Uh, uh, the thing I suggested is like a Gnosis safe multisig where the uh, addresses going into the Gnosis safe just like are addresses that kind of output a message that says send the money out if there is a zero knowledge proof of a particular withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, so, with uh, that kind of uh, stuff, like, you know, we might be able to have a uh, middle phase where we get a lot of uh, benefit from the uh, technology protecting us, but like we aren't fully vulnerable to like one thing having uh, bugs that uh, break everything. Mm -hmm. But that's on the on the zk yeah, side and on things uh, closer to the base layer. On the yeah, application side, it's like a different story, right? Because uh, like I, I mean, almost all of these. Uh, DeFi hacks, they happen in applications that I don't use and I would never endorse using. And there's like all of these other communities of people that just have, um, you know, much more aggressive um, ideas about what kinds of things they want to do on chain. And, uh, you know, some of them are just inevitably going to overshoot, uh, well, you know, whatever is the uh, actual level of uh, capability of what we can make secure. 
Um, so I think the best that we can do is just kind of slowly expands the frontier of uh, what kinds of things can be done safely over time, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we, ha we have safe multi-sig wallets now. We did not have safe multi-sig wallets five years ago. You know, remember Parity, right? <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, Uniswap has been safe for a long time, right? Like, um, you know, the MakerDAO contracts uh, have been safe for a long time and you know, people started to make forks off of them. Um, you know, we're going to move toward like different DAO governance contracts becoming more and more safe over time. Safety is going to increase with, uh, you know, more and more fancy form of verification happening. And uh, there's going to be a yeah, bigger and bigger space of things that you can do where it's fairly comfortable that, um, you know, you can do them safely. And then there is going to be this kind of bigger zone of, uh, you know, crazy stuff where if people go into that zone, they're going to lose lots of money. And uh, like, that's unavoidable. The be the thing that we can do and that is important is, of course, like, do a much better job of communicating the difference between the yeah, safe zone and the yeah, crazy zone. And uh, that's something that, like, we've been, not, like, I think medium good at over time. Um, there, like, there's a limit to how good we can be because, uh, like, unfortunately, you know, if you uh, if you call out bad projects for being bad, then like you're not going to be uh, welcomed in the bad project community sure. anymore. And there's uh, going to be a community of people that just kind of ignore, you know, the pe sane people entirely. But uh, like, try more to do that. Um, that's you know. Yeah, tr try more to do that. Put more safety tools in uh, people's hands. Try our best to protect the people that we can protect. Um, try our best to, um, you know, when we can, respond to hacks after the fact. Uh, do a good job of uh, responding to them. Just kind of do the stuff that the good parts of the Ethereum ecosystem have been doing, but um, you know, do, uh, just keep uh, doing them and do a better job of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I think that's, that's a perfect answer. Um, we just got a figure from, from your people, so I hope that means one more question, mm -hmm. uh, a very short one. Um, what, what do we absolutely need to get right in the next year as an ecosystem? So what's the one thing you think we need to pay attention to um, in order to succeed? I'd still say scalability. Scalability, yeah. okay. I think uh, scalability is like the big one because uh, I, th I do think that there it is one of those areas where there is a limited time window because uh, if we don't solve scalability by the next well market, then you know there's just an overwhelming chance that like forms of scaling by sacrificing all attempts at trustlessness are just going to become legitimized and dominate. And uh, that's something that's going to be very hard to come back from, right? And uh, like scalability is something that, you know, we have to get right. We have to make progress at getting right. And, uh, you know, we uh, have to uh, kind of put in the uh, initial steps to make sure that there is a good path toward um, improving that scalability over time. And it's like a big challenge, but, um, you know, there's also lots of very smart and hard hardworking people working on making it happen. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming yeah. on Epicenter. Thank, thank you so much for being Epicenter. <laughs>